What is the single most important event which led to the fall of the Western Roman Empire? Well, there are many different possibilities here, but I'm going to argue that there is one event of special importance that could be called the beginning of the end for the Western Roman Empire, namely the crossing of the Rhine in 406 AD by a coalition of many different Germanic tribes. This event would lead to a devastating chain reaction of further negative events, which would culminate in the fall of the Western Roman Empire 70 years later. Let us then examine how it could come to such a disaster and why most attempts for damage control failed and also what consequences this momentous event had on the Western Roman Empire after that fateful year of 406 AD. There are quite a few momentous events in the history of the late Roman Empire where, if they had gone differently, the world might look vastly different today. The historical narrative is that the Western Roman Empire was doomed to die, but in fact it could have been saved many times, despite the severe underlying problems it had. I made two videos about some events where, if history had gone differently, the Roman Empire might have been saved, link in the description. But one event especially, namely the crossing of the river Rhine in 406 AD, deserves special attention, as this was the event that would lead to a quick unraveling of the Western Roman Empire. It was a time of great migrations that are thought to have been initiated by the fearsome Hunnic horseback riders who pressured westwards. Thus, many Germanic tribes in turn fled from these fearsome warriors. This is why in 376 AD the Goths had crossed the Danube River southward into the Roman Empire in order to seek refuge from the Hunnic onslaught. But the Romans never before had to deal with such a situation, namely tens of thousands of Goths of all genders and ages crossing into Roman territory and seeking refuge. The Romans handled the situation pretty badly, so that famine and hunger would ravage the Goths, which in turn caused them to rebel against the Romans. The exact chain of events will be explored in a separate video. But this failed integration would lead to the Battle of Hadrianople, also often called Adrianople, in 378 AD, where the Eastern Roman Empire, through the folly of the Emperor Valens, would suffer a major military defeat. This defeat allowed the Goths to roam largely uncontested through the Balkans and they sacked many cities in their way and settled down on Roman territory, creating their own quasi-independent kingdom. As a direct consequence, 32 years later, the very same Goths would then sack Rome in 410 AD. But the failure of Valens would have another consequence. It would be a proof to the other Germanic tribes that the Romans were not as strong as they had thought. Stories reached them how their kinsmen, the Goths, were now roaming largely uncontested through the Roman Empire, pillaging cities and plundering many riches. Confronted with the choice of fighting the fearsome Huns or trying their luck in this apparently quite weak empire, many Germanic tribes then decided that the latter option was certainly more desirable. The Western Roman borders were protected by the Limes, a series of defensive fortifications in form of walls, watchtowers and legionary forts. Often the Limes would use natural formations such as rivers and the strategic positioning of castellums with troops along them as to hinder enemy tribes of crossing into Roman territory. This system worked quite well for hundreds of years, except during the crisis of the 3rd century. Here we would already see for the first time that the Germanic tribes at the borders of the Imperium would immediately know how to exploit an empire weakened by civil war. Many of the border fortifications were overrun and many cities in territories of the Roman Empire sacked. 
but Rome recovered thanks to valiant efforts from people like Maximus Trax, Gallienus, Claudius Gothicus and the legendary Aurelian. Especially Maximus Trax's campaigns deep into Germania are deserving of a separate video as it shows us the empire's incredible strength even at that time. After order had been restored in the late 3rd century AD, the fortifications again worked well for over a hundred years. But now an unprecedented number of Germanic people were fleeing from the Huns, pressuring westward and southward into the empire. And the defeat of the Romans at Hadrianople had shown the Germanic people that the Romans were not invincible anymore, that this once mighty empire had apparently become old and frail. And please subscribe to this channel if you don't want to miss future videos on many topics, especially of the late Roman Empire, so that we can learn how exactly the Imperium Romanum fell, and about the heroes and their valiant attempts to save it. And you can even support us now directly on YouTube via the YouTube membership or on Patreon, so that hopefully we can improve this channel and make even better animations and drawings for future videos. Gratias a tibi amici. Therefore, a large coalition of Germanic tribes attempted to cross into the territory of the Roman Empire. However, we said that the frontier was placed strategically along rivers and where there were no rivers, great fortified wall systems had been erected with many legionary forts. It must also be noted that the crossing south over the Alps was dangerous and the Roman forces in Italy too strong. Attempts of the Vandals to invade Italy in 405 AD had failed thanks to the efforts of Stilico. A new route into the Roman lands had to be found. Thus, the chieftains of the Germanic people knew that crossing into Roman territory in Italy at any time or into Gallia in between spring and fall would be an almost impossible endeavor. But in winter, when the rivers were sometimes completely frozen, there certainly might be a spot along the less populated border to Gallia where they could cross into Roman lands, would there not? It was thus, according to most sources, that a large coalition of Vandals, Quadi, Sarmatians, Alans, Gepids, Heruls, Saxons, Burgundians and Alemanni crossed the frozen river Rhine on the 30th or 31st of December of the year 406 AD. They made use of the very cold winter where even the Rhine was frozen solid and crossed in large numbers into the territory of the Western Roman Empire. Although some historians think that they might have crossed over bridges or built boats and that the river was actually not completely frozen. It is the current consensus that the location where this happened was very near to the city of Mogontiacum, modern day Mainz in Germany, namely because this was the first Roman city to be devastated by this incursion according to Jerome, who wrote about this event. He further specified that the Vandals were starving due to scarcity of food during winter and therefore decided to raid Mogontiacum in order to plunder its food supply. But how could this be? How could the Roman border defenses prove to be so incredibly ineffective? There are a few theories about this, but the most likely one, also for me, is a direct consequence of the Battle of the Frigidus River. Here, a quite large part of the Western Roman troops was destroyed in this disastrous battle in 394 AD. And as the late Roman Empire had quite the difficulty in finding new recruits, as more and more Romans had become unwilling to die for their empire, it is believed that even 12 years after that battle, the lost legions had not been replenished. Therefore, the Magister Militum of the West Flavius Stilico made use more and more frequently of paid Germanic mercenaries that would be foederati to the Imperium. However, the Goths would start raiding Italy in the early 400s and Stilico simply lacked the troops to deal with this threat. It is thus thought that he withdrew many border troops from the Rhine frontier in order to help defend Italy against the Gothic incursions with overwhelming success, it should be noted. 
He defeated Alaric and his Goths in 402 AD at the Battle of Polentia in northwestern Italy. And then he defeated another Gothic army in 405 AD under Radagaisus and also hindered the Vandals to cross into Italy that same year. But it is said that Stilicho was so desperate for new recruits that even slaves were enrolled into the army in exchange for their freedom. This shows that indeed enrolling new recruits had become a severe problem in the late empire, quite different from the days of the Republic where tens of thousands of Romans would die against Hannibal just for the Romans to recruit completely new armies from native Romans in Italy only a short while later. We shall explore this fascinating phenomenon in a different video as to why exactly the martial vigor of the native Roman Italic population had declined so drastically. But it is thought that Stilicho, being desperate to defend northern Italy against the Germanic invaders, not only recruited slaves, but also withdrew a lot of troops from the Rhine frontier. We can thus see how interconnected this chain of events was. A negative feedback loop of sorts had been initiated with the battles of Adrianople and Frigidus River. It is thought that only Frankish and Alemanni Foederati forces were defending the border when the Germanic coalition entered the Imperium near Mainz. According to fragments from the 5th century historian Renatus Profuturus Frigiridus, the Frankish Foederati were initially even successful in preventing the Vandals from advancing into Roman territory, but they were overwhelmed when the Alans joined the Vandals. Stilicho was still occupied with defending Italy even as late as 406 AD when Radagaisus harassed northern Italy a second time, but this time he was completely defeated and executed in August 406. So it is possible that there was simply not enough time to reorganize and defend the Rhine border after the events of the winter of 406 AD. Thus, the coalition of Germanic invaders managed to defeat the Frankish and Alemanni Foederati and sacked and pillaged the first aforementioned cities. First Mogontiacum, then Vangionum, then Nemetis, and then Argenturatum. After that, they branched out westward and sacked the mighty Augusta Treverorum, modern-day Trier, which back then was a very large city with 80,000 inhabitants. They continued further, sacking and pillaging many cities of northern Gaul and then branching south and sacking many major cities of southern Gaul until 409 AD. This must have been brutal for the native Roman population. We can be pretty sure that quite often this would result in the death of many Roman civilians and many others were captured by the barbarians. So the theory that seems to be popular these days that somehow the Germanic tribes peacefully settled on the territory of the Roman Empire is really an absolutely wrong theory based on the romantic and wishful thinking that humans are always quite friendly to each other. Well. They are still not, and much less often were they friendly to each other in the 5th century AD. But now the question arises, how could the Romans have let this happen? How could the still mighty Western Roman Empire, that as we saw was thanks to Stilicho, still capable of impressive victories, let Gallia be ravaged by barbarians? Well, first of all, the really bad Emperor Honorius had the great Magister Militum Flavius Stilicho, the defender of Rome, killed in 408 AD with dire consequences for the Empire. But I have to admit that Stilicho himself also made some mistakes. We shall talk about that in the next video. But with no effective military commander, mounting organized resistance had now become very difficult. It really was that every local military garrison of every fortified city was on their own against the barbarian invaders. Some would manage to stave off the attackers, but some were not and then were sacked. And some even deliberately opened their respective city gates to the barbarians in order to appease them as they knew that the alternative, if they lost, would be highly unpleasant. 
this chaos now had in turn multiple really bad effects. First of all, tax collection was disrupted as the territories where the barbarians would settle within the Western Roman Empire would effectively cease to be part of this imperium. Therefore, this would lead to a severe erosion of the tax base, diminishing the revenue and therefore reducing the empire's ability to recruit new military troops for defending that very empire. Secondly, the ensuing chaos gave way to a new phenomenon where the lowest ranks of Roman society would saw their chance come to rebel against their oppressors. These were mostly Roman farmers who basically in these times had become quasi-serfs to rich landowners. This was already a foreshadowing of the later feudal system. These poor Roman peasants were highly unhappy with how the empire treated them and made use of these chaotic times by organizing themselves and rising up against the Roman authorities, very often even joining the Germanic attackers in their pillaging and sacking. And then there were the slaves, who of course were very unhappy with their status of being slaves for rich Romans. They also joined these rebels. And these rebels came to be known as the Bacchaudai, and they would become a real problem for the empire as additional military troops had to be allocated for quelling these rebellions, troops that would have been direly needed against the Germanic invaders. Also, it should be noted that the very specialized Roman economy made an effective defense more difficult. Military equipment such as armor and weapons were not built locally, but in faraway production locations throughout the empire. Therefore, the locals often simply lacked the necessary skills and equipment in order to mount a more effective defense. But as if the erosion of the tax base, inability of local Romans to defend themselves due to a high degree of specialization, pillaging barbarians and Bacchaudai rebels was not bad enough, the weakness of the empire immediately led to many usurpers popping up that would challenge the imperial rule. Britannia had always been a problematic province for the empire, as the Roman troops stationed there would regularly proclaim new emperors, since serving there was absolutely no fun. Quite understandably, the troops always wanted to go away from these harsh and brutal lands as soon as possible. A phenomenon that can be still encountered today, because last I heard, the weather there has not improved since Roman times. How Britannia was so problematic and how it would contribute to the fall of the Roman Empire shall be explored in another video. So the Roman troops in Britannia proclaimed Marcus as their new emperor in 406 AD. But they weren't happy with him apparently as they killed him later the same year, replacing them with Gratian. But Gratian was hesitant to cross over to the mainland as the troops wished and so he was also killed and finally replaced with Constantine III. This latest usurper then took all Roman troops from Britannia and left the island undefended to itself in around 408 AD. After the Romans had left, Britannia would now fall slowly back to a level of living standards comparable to Bronze Age Europe and we shall also explore that in another video. But instead of focusing on the barbarian threat, the incapable Western Roman Emperor Honorius would bind the Roman forces in many battles against Constantine III's troops. To make things worse, two other usurpers, Gerontius and Maximus, rebelled in Hispania. So instead of facing the barbarian invasion as united military force, the Romans again did what they did best in times of crisis, namely fighting against each other, killing themselves by the thousands or tens of thousands, further weakening their armies and making it easier for the Germanic invaders to win. It is especially the fault of Honorius, who focused too many of the empire's vital troops to fight against usurpers instead of putting these troops to use against the barbarians. Honorius found a very able military commander in the form of Constantius III, about whom we will talk in more detail in the next video, who managed to defeat all three usurpers, Gerontius, Maximus and Constantine III, 
managing to restore some form of order in Gaul and to settle some of the Germanic tribes as Foederati within the borders of the empire. By 420, Constantius had managed to restore control of much of Hispania and Gaul, but the damage had been done. By focusing too much on the usurpers, the chance to defeat or repel the Germanic invaders had been given away. These Germanic tribes had now established their own quasi-independent kingdoms in parts of the Western Roman Empire. Many cities had been sacked or destroyed, and usurpers would now become a common occurrence, causing constant civil wars where the Romans would die killing other Romans instead of fighting against the barbarians. The Bacaudai rebels would continue to further weaken the empire's troops. The emperors would unfortunately also continue to be incapable. In addition to the constant civil wars, now the Magister Minitums and the emperors would also fight for power. This struggle between emperors and Magister Minitums would kill able people like Stilico, Aetius, and later Majorian, Antemius, and others which would weaken the Western Empire even more until all the troops and resources would have been spent and until then, in 476 AD, a barbarian chieftain named Odoacar would end the rule of the Empress in the West. We can thus say that the crossing of the River Rhine in 406 AD was indeed a momentous event where the fate of a civilization was decided. A true cascade of negative events had been set into motion by it that would in turn create other negative events for the Roman Empire, and so on and so forth, culminating in the fall of the Western Roman Empire 70 years later. And without its Western Roman ally, the fate of the Eastern Roman Empire was in fact also decided. Therefore, it was really where the fate of the world was decided on those cold winter days of 406 AD. Thank you dear friends of late Roman history for watching this video and thanks also especially to all our Patreons and our supporters via the YouTube membership and also to the people who donated to us via PayPal. You people are awesome and I like to think that Majorian would be proud could he see that you are supporting a channel bearing his name. If you are interested to see how the collapse of the Roman borders would have looked some decades after the crossing of the Rhine at the Danube frontier, you can watch the first video here. Or if you are more interested in what the collapse of the Imperium meant for the city of Rome itself, you can watch the second video here. I say farewell dear Amici Imperii Romani and Bene Vale.